Carol Maver's brilliant work on history, photography, sexuality, and subversive reading has gathered international attention and alarm. <laughs> it is not just that Carol sees more deeply than others, but she also speaks what she sees, even or especially when what she sees is what we are pretty frightened to hear. For this very reason, she is the most productive and powerful scholar working in the intersection of 19th century visual studies, literature, sexuality, and cultural theory. Professor Maver's wild career got off to a moderately reputable start <laughs> with a PhD in the History of Consciousness program at UC Santa Cruz. But from there, it has all been downhill. <laughs> Despite holding a position in a wonderful art history department at the <laughs> University of North Carolina, through whose ranks she has risen meteorically. Winner of scores of teaching awards, national and international fellowships, Carol has, with her appearance here today, truly arrived in the big time. <laughs> she told me so herself. Jim, Jim, she said, this is the big time. <laughs> Carol, I said, it is. <laughs> she is the author of the phenomenally original and zinging Pleasures Taken, Performances of Sexuality and Loss in Victorian Photography, published in 1996, followed a few years later by Becoming, the Photography of Clementina by Countess Hardwood. Her next book, appearing with indecent haste on the heels of the last, is Reading Boyishly, Roland Bart, J.M. Barry, Jacques uh, Henri Herting, Pro Marcel Proust, and D.M. Winnicott, which will appear later this year. It is a great experience to be even within 10 miles of Carol Maver. <laughs> to hear her speak is unparalleled happiness. <laughs> she speaks to us today on forgetting to eat, Alice's mouthing metonymy. Carol. It is the filmmaker's wife playing the white rabbit, which is of special interest to me. <laughs> okay. Forgetting to eat. Alice's mouthing metonymy. At meals, he was very careful always, while he took nothing in the middle of the day except a glass of wine and a biscuit. Under these circumstances, it is not very surprising that the healthy appetites of his little friends filled him with wonder and even with alarm. When he took a certain one of them out with him to a friend's house to dinner, he used to give the host or hostess a gentle warning to the mixed amazement and indignation of a child. Please be careful, because she eats a good deal too much. <laughs> and that's uh, Collingwood uh, talking in the lives and letters of Lewis Carroll. And now, a wonderful little Lewis Carroll letter. My dear Agnes, at last I've succeeded in forgetting you. It's been a very hard job, but I took six lessons in forgetting. At half a crown a lesson, 
After three lessons, I forgot my own name, and I forgot to go for the next lesson. So the professor said I was getting on very well, but I hope he added, you won't forget to pay for the lessons. I said that would depend on whether the other lessons were good or not. And do you know, the last of the six lessons was so good that I forgot everything. I forgot who I was, I forgot to eat my dinner. The Alice stories are lessons in forgetting. And now who am I? I will remember if I can. I'm determined to do it. I know it begins with L. And eating. It had a sort of mixed flavor of cherry tart, custard, pineapple, roast turkey, toffee, and hot buttered toast. In both stories, but especially in Wonderland, nearly every action seems to hedonistically turn on eating and consumption. Like Marcel Proust's long, long, remarkably different in search of lost time, the emphasis on food is in the absence of nourishment. But in opposition to Proust's bit of Madeleine cake dipped in tea, which is now is a trope, even a cliche, for profound memory, Alice's eating is all about forgetting. In Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass, Alice remembers very little about home, save for her always hungry cat, Dinah. Dinah will miss me very much tonight, I should think. I hope they'll remember her saucer of milk at tea time. Dinah, my dear, I wish you were down here with me. There are mice, there are no mice in the air, I am afraid, but you might catch a bat, but do cats eat bats, I wonder. Save for her reminiscing about Dinah, it seems that there is hardly a nostalgic, and of course the etymology of nostalgia is homesickness, or homesick. There is hardly a nostalgic, homesick, remembering bone in Alice's fantastic, metamorphosizing, textual, writhing, writing, always hungry body. As we know from reading The Looking Glass, once Alice had really frightened her old nurse by shouting suddenly in her ear, nurse, do let's pretend that I am a hungry hyena and you're a bone. <laughs> For Alice, bones hold no sacred memories or past. They're just food and bar barely that. After all, a bone is for chewing and gnawing and tasting and picking and licking. It's really not much to eat. A bone feeds a hunger of a different <coughs> order. It's all about morsels, nibbles, and bits. Just try to imagine how teeny tiny Alice's bit of mushroom would have had to have been when she was but three inches tall. Like Prue's search, the Alice stories insist on eating that is really not eating. When tasting the fa famed Madeleine cake from which grew all the volumes of the search given to him by Mama on a warm, uh, on a winter's day during a return to home, Marcel takes only a morsel of the cake and a mere spoonful of the tea. From that crumb blossomed all of the volumes of the search. Likewise, the magnificent physical but never meaningful, at least to Alice, metamorphoses caused from drinking a bottle not marked poison or eating a bit of mushroom or swallowing a pebble turned cake are strangely parallel to the intellectual metamorphoses of the search made possible by a couple of crumbs. Through Proust's search, things meant for even eating and even things not meant for eating are described deliciously. Tasty words at the tip of his tongue but rarely does Marcel physically describe the devouring of the food. In his boyhood home of Cambrai, Marcel's Sunday luncheon table typically included this spread. Eggs, cutlets, potatoes, preserves, and biscuits, a brill, a turkey, cardoons with marrow, a roast leg of mutton, spinach, gooseberries, raspberries, cherries, a cream cheese, an almond cake, a brioche, and a chocolate cream. As I have argued in my recent book, being produced, hopefully, Reading Boyishly, and is made especially apparent in Proust's essay entitled On Reading, despite such deliciousness, Marcel rarely takes a swallow. He would rather be reading than eating. He is an anorectic hedonist. Carol, Carol in his thoroughly non-French British way, 
has his own dress tables with their own anorectic hedonistic tendencies, like the one that appears in the Wonderland's mad tea party, where Alice is told that there is no room for her at the big table when there is, in fact, plenty of room, where Alice is offered non-existent wine, where Alice learns of three girls named Elsie, Lacey, and Tilly, who lived at the bottom of the well, eating nothing but treacle. By the time we get to the end of the looking glass, Queen Alice arrives to find an even larger table, a table set for about 50 guests. Having already missed the soup and the fish, Alice is confronted by an animistic leg of mutton crowned with his own paper frill, frill crown. And with a little bow on the meat's part and one return by Alice, they meet. Alice, mutton, mutton, Alice. I don't know why that's like my favorite line of the whole book. <laughs> but how could Alice ever slice someone she has just met? It is an etiquette to cut at anyone you've been introduced to, decidedly scolds the Red Queen. There is nothing to do but remove the joint and bring out the pudding. In an attempt to avoid more shameful embarrassment when faced with cutting food that talks, Alice hastily says, I won't be introduced to the pudding, please, or we shall get no dinner at all. No sooner had Alice said this and the pudding was removed. In a wink, things turn apocalyptic with bottles turning into birds, with plates for wings and forks for legs, and the Red Queen's broad, good-natured face is last seen grinning before it disappears into the soup. The effect of the Alice stories, like that of the Cirques, is a consuming based on withholding. Consider those start tarts stolen but not eaten, or, re or recall when the little bits of comfits are handed around the at the caucus race. The large birds complained that they could not taste theirs, and the small ones choked and had to be patted on the back. And don't forget the hatter, who complains that the bread and butter are getting so thin. As the white queen makes clear as pudding, jam tomorrow and jam yesterday, but never jam today. For it will never be exactly time for Alice to eat the jam. The same is true for the plum cake, Hand it around first and cut it afterwards, orders the unicorn to the baffled Alice. It's all about cutting up, whether it be the roast, the pudding, or the fish. But it is an eating of a different order. Alice, as we learn in Wonderland, and I quote, always took a great interest in questions of eating and drinking. Alice is surprisingly willing to eat a bit of anything as she moves through her two dreamy landscapes that undisputably hail the unconscious. Alice is fearless in her bit eating. The only thing that seems to be at stake is etiquette. As Freud offers in his essay, uh, The, Con the Con Consciousness and What is Unconscious, there's no no in the unconscious. When Alice says, nurse, do let's pretend that I'm a hungry hyena and you're a bone, I smack my lips with dangerous thoughts of naughty, risky food. James Kincaid has schooled me well with the close ties between a kissing spank, smack and a spanking smack. With Alice's hungry nurse desiring hyena lips in mind, in Russia's Merritt Oppenheim's own 1936 feast on a nurse, her dangerously delectable piece entitled My Nurse that you're seeing there on the left. Served up like all yummy foods on an eye-catching platter is a pair of Freudian slippers, white ladies' pumps to be exact, bound together with sadistic sexy string like a gift waiting to be untied by one's teeth, of course. And best of all, the most delectable parts, the devious heels, have slipped on their own little paper frills, as if they were a pair of yummy lamb chops get out the mint sauce or chicken legs crunchy on the outside and juicy within, or even the looking glass mutton himself. But there is nothing to nourish here in any kind of nutritional way. It is about a mouth that does not nurture and the pleasures and the dangers of the surface-oriented eating. This kind of eating is closer to kissing and licking. It is an eating that is about risk. To eat in Alice's world is to surrealistically make mouths into eyes and eyes into mouths in a substitute of practice that cooks up nonsense. In the words of Carol's Mad Hatter, why you might just as well say that I see what I eat is the same that I eat what I see. 
In Alice's world, as the Hatter Eater knows, it's always tea time. And if it's always tea time, then we are always hungry. We are always wild with desire. We are endless, endlessly chasing the white rabbit, whom Helen Sixou rudely and hilariously names as a pina sans pas. The rabbit, then, is a Lacanian metonymic carrot on a string always before us, or as Lacan himself might write, the rabbit as our carrot is, in fact, eternally stretching forth towards the desire for something else. It is a game of an endless series of displacements. It is in this endless chain of Carolinian word-to-word -word connections, a chain of isolated signifiers, a place of nonsense where we find ourselves stripped of what lies on the other side of metonymy, the other side being metaphor, memory, and meaning. We just might find ourselves slip, sipping from Mayor Oppenheim's 1936 breakfast in fur, itself a portmanteau object of rabbit and teacup. A rabbit teacup, I'm trying to make a portmanteau there, a rabbit teacup, something like that. Um, enjoyed in anticipation of the dormouse stuffed into the teapot, a soft furry condensation of the white rabbit with the Mad Hatter's cup of tea. Hardly Proustian. Oppenheim's teacup is horrific. It is a fully sensate imagination of tea drinking. Think of the smell of the fur, wet, warm, and soaking with tea. Open your mouth to the cup and dream of the feeling of a rabbit pelt in your mouth. Suppose the queerness of this soft touch of the cup on the quiescent saucer. Hardly Proustian, this cup of tea is not likely to nostalgically remind anyone of their old aunt, at least in any kind of nurturing sense. Furthermore, breakfast and fur is padded against the possibility, even of the oral, the A-U-R-A-L uh, spell that turns on sound. No chance here of an involuntary memory evoked from a Proustian chance knock of a spoon against a plate. Here, stirring your tea in a fur cup and placing your fur spoon on your fur saucer would be entirely soundless. Breakfast and fur, like the Alice stories, is about forgetting the past and experiencing the present in a most non-normative way. As in Oppenheim's work, the Alice stories present us with plenty of feeding, but not much nurturing. Just as the Mad Hatter bit a large piece out of his teacup instead of the bread and butter, when you take a bite in Wonderland, eating is more about reading. It's a meta metonymic surfix, eating nonsense. Through punning and word switching, words become isolated signifiers that resist meaning and sense. According to Lacan, the displacement is metonymy and desire is metonymy. Thus, the absence of complete satisfaction coupled with displacements characterizes what Lacan calls desire. Desire, Lacan says, is eccentric. Eccentric means having a displaced center, which is to say, in Freud's words, forced away from the aim and into displacements. That's Alice, all right. No deep meaning here, despite the fall down, 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 with the fall never come to an end. Alice is all about traveling downward, falling into the hole where memory and meaning is evacuated. Eating makes all the forgetting possible. Still today, perhaps with our own touch of deliciousness, it is not uncommon to drown our sorrows in a bag of potato chips, a carton of ice cream, a box of chocolate, more than a handful of cookies, for all of this immediate consumption is all too readily available. But Alice's forgetting comes out of, a, out of eating almost nothing at all. She's a pecker, not a gorger. She's a beggar, but not an eater. Although not named as such, nor even seen, Lethe, the meandering stream of forgetfulness, is everywhere in the geography of Alice. L, I know it begins with L. Alice drowns in Lethe, swallowing its waters as if they were her very own tears. Forgetting is the only sure thing that Alice is the least likely to forget. Alice, in her own way, via the waterways of her alter ego, Lewis Carroll, L, I know it begins with L, is consumed with the art of forgetting. Memory, as the ancient and modern philosophers have taught us, is a storehouse, a cellar, a well, 
Hegel's deep well of the eye, perhaps even a rabbit hole or a treacle well. As Gaston Bachelard has demonstrated, while in the attic, fears can be rationalized, even enlightened, but in the cellar, darkness prevails both day and night. The cellar dreamer knows that the walls of the cellar are buried walls, and the deeper that Alice descends, the closer that she comes to that dark place of forgetting. As Harold Weinrich so elegantly writes in his book, Lethe, The Art and Critique of Forgetting, perhaps forgetting is also only, in trivial terms, a hole in memory into which something falls or disappears. Death is the penultimate form of forgetting. On the most base level, forgetting makes possible living without death, but forgetting is also death itself. As Milan Pandara has written, forgetting is the great private problem of man, death as the loss of self. But what of this self? It is the sum of everything we remember. Thus what terrifies us about death is not the loss of future, but the loss of past. Forgetting is a form of death ever present within life. End of quote. Forgetting is good and bad. In the great multiplication table of the ever expanding worlds of the Dodo da 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 Dachin's pen, and perhaps even especially his photographs, themselves infinitely reproducible, never necessarily just one are always already, always already troubled by the mark of death. Photography is a trace of death, of a moment forever gone. The whole then might signify death, but it is also the place for death to disappear, to be forgotten. Photography is also a trace of a moment forever held, forever young. The mise-en-scene of Alice, then, is a forgetting place for getting rid of death. The hole and the possibilities of leaving it open is an optimistic gap, a place not to fill, a stomach left hungry, a history promised but left untold. You promised to tell me your history, you know, said Alice, and why it is you hate C and D. And much to our frustration and our delight, the story is never really told. C and D remain empty signifiers for the reader to form, perform our own long and sad tale, or even a long tale, T-A-I-L. But the point is, Alice, whether you fall for her or go through her, is less a narrative than a romp. There's no Oedipal climax, no character development, no sentimentality, hardly a memory of what has happened just pages before. But that's just it. It's a staging of desire, a play left open. Whether C and D is for Charles and Dodgson, Carol and Dodo, or even Sisu and Derrida. After all, Derrida, like Alice, loves cats and understands purring as the ultimate deconstructionist utterance. To this effect, Derrida cites the following passage from Through the Looking Glass. It is a very inconvenient habit of kittens, Alice had once made the remark, that whatever you say to them, they always purr. If they would only purr for yes and mew for no, or any rule of that sort, she had said, so that one could keep up a conversation. But how can you talk to, with a person if they always say the same thing? On this occasion, the kitten only purred and it was impossible to guess whether it meant yes or no. The kitten in question is the offspring of Dinah, who incidentally starts both the Wonderland and Looking Glass stories. Dinah is one of the very few things, whether they be people, places, pets, or objects, that Alice shows any longing or nostalgia towards. As the bourgeois snob, she has no longing for someone like Mabel, who Alice remembers as stupid and poor in her pokey little house with no toys to play with. Furthermore, Alice sheds no tears for the lost mother or father. It is the cat, perhaps only the cat, whether she take the form of Dinah herself or the metamorphosized form of the Cheshire cat or the form of a black kitten or a white kitten as birthed by Mother Dinah. Alice, um, 
Carol's stories um, for children are surprisingly bereft of nostalgia. For, Al for example, Alice uh, does not, t does, but standing apart is, um, the, a sen is the sentimentality that, Dinah that she feels for Dinah. For Dinah, she says, is a dear quiet thing. She sits purring so nicely by the fire, licking her paws and washing her face, and she is such a nice soft thing to nurse. It is in this way that the cat can be understood as a metonymy for memory, especially the Cheshire cat. In Wonderland, Dinah is displaced by the Cheshire cat, whom the ever polite Alice addresses as Cheshire Puss, in hopes that this feline with very long claws and a great many teeth might feel respected. And of course, both Dinah and the Cheshire cat are all mouth. While Dinah is associated with saucers of milk and hunting mice, her displaced image as Cheshire cat is literally all mouth. Well, I've often seen a cat without a grin, thought Alice, but a grin without a cat is the most curious thing I've seen ever saw in my life. Like the rabbit hole, this Cheshire cat hole is yet another spatiality of memory to fall into. Anorectically metonymic, it feeds nothing. It stresses the void rather than a recuperation of memory. It is its evacuation. By falling headfirst right down the rabbit hole filled with cupboards, Alice initiates the eating down under by grabbing a jar labeled orange marmalade. But to her great disappointment, it was empty. Likewise, she drinks language through a bottle, not empty, tag drink me, and chews language through a cake marked eat me, spelled out in currants. In an echo of the Mad Hatter's paradox of whether I eat what I see is the same as I see what I eat, Alice just might say, I read what I eat is the same thing as I eat what I read. Getting biblical with my preacher man, yes, another hat of our mathematician, logician, writer, inventor, photographer, Oxford Don, I cannot help but quote Jeremiah 15, 16. When your words came, I ate them. When Alice eats the whole very small cake on which the words eat me were beautifully marked in currants, Alice decides to quote, set to work and very soon finished off the cake. I do not think that I've ever found a small cake very laborious to eat. But small words, on the other hand, they can be a real bother, especially verbs, the category of which the word eat belongs. Like Humpty Dumpty claims, they have a temper, some of them, particularly verbs, they're the proudest. Adjectives you can do anything with, but not verbs. And let us not forget that Humpty Dumpty, who claims himself as the master of language, is an egg, is something to eat. And like the Cheshire cat, is all mouth to the point that he is verging on decapitation. If he smiled much more, the ends of his mouth might meet behind, she thought, and then I don't know what would happen to his head. I'm afraid it would come off. It's all about displacement, about mouthing, metonymy. Eating as grammatical work is a form of anorexic eating. For the anorexic, eating is always work in that it not only keeps metonymic desire in check, for one is never full, fulfilled, it always embraces death. Death is the soulmate of the anorexic. Nevertheless, eating also keeps you close to death in that you must eat to grow up. This to eat is to die as always already coupled with a uh, not to eat is to die, is also a double theme of J.M. Barry's Neverland, a faraway island where Peter, the only child to never grow up, hardly ever eats and is as fond of pretend food as real food. As Wendy herself notes, he could eat, really eat, if it was part of a game, but he could not stodge as in to make oneself gorge in order to experience that delicious, rich, filling quality, just to feel stodgy, which is what most children do, which, which is what most children like better than anything else. The next best thing being to, talk, be, being to talk about it. Make believe was so real to him that during a meal of it, you could see him getting rounder. Likewise, in Alice, the excess of growing, of language itself, of babies turning into omnivorous pigs is always matched by the impossibility of a full meal, a real meal. 
Alice's orderly suppression of eating within the Wonderland and Looking Glass words is ultimately a purification of appetite. In the words of Adam Phillips, a world is created in which nothing can be eaten, nothing must be taken in. What might this suggest about narrative itself? Carol claims the story, gives us a framework, a menu to peruse, but then ultimately withholds the narrative, at least one conventionally told. Filled to the broom with rich words, which can never have only one meaning, but always have layers of meaning, like a fancy cake that places chocolate on top of raspberry, jam on top of vanilla ice cream. There is no food to really sink our teeth into. To go underground and through the mirror is to be at once anorectic and hedonistic. Carol seemingly says, I would prefer not to tell a story, just as the anorexic politely refuses not to eat, I would prefer not to. Nevertheless, the anorexic knows how to present a meal and trim a table, just as Carol gives us one of the most excessive, complex, often quoted pieces of fiction in the history of Anglo-American literature. We want to sit down and to read, to eat. An eating disorder, as the ultimate order of eating, is a place of obsession that is often hailed in other aspects of daily life. The anorexic knows all about this. Carol himself was filled to the brim with his own, one might claim, obsessive orderliness. We know that he only lunched each day on sherry and a biscuit. In a more reflective but related way, his journals record dinner parties mapping where each guest sat and what each guest ate. When packing for a trip, Carol wrapped each article of clothing in so much tissue paper that there was more paper than shirts, than pants, than shoes, than anything else. Carol's pamphlet, eight or nine words about letter writing sold with the Wonderland postage stamp holder included such precise directions uh, for logging letters in and out that one might not ever want to write one. What kind of eating is all of this uh, licking of stamps and envelopes under the auspices of perfect order? However, such order and etiquette seemed only to fuel Carol's own pen. It is estimated that Carol wrote over 100,000 letters in his last 37 years alone. This is leaving off his first 29 years. Um, you might want to note that, in, or you probably already know, of course, all of you people know all of these things, that on the front of the envelope of the Wonderland postage stamp cases, uh, Alice nursing the Duchess's baby. And then when you pull out the interior stamp case, the baby turns into an omnivorous pig. Uh, Carol's rule for writing the controversial letter um, is worth <laughs> noting, for the rule is all about taste and uh, making it sweet. This was for writing a controversial letter. Um, in Carol's own words, another rule is, it's probably a good one, when you have written a letter that you feel may possibly irritate your friend, however necessary you may have felt it is to express yourself, put it aside till the next day. Then read it over again and fancy it addressed to yourself. This will often lead to your writing it all over again, taking out a lot of the vinegar and pepper and putting in honey instead, and thus making a much more palatable dish of it. This two-sided notion of anorectic hedonistic eating or even letter writing is in fact at the heart of the definition of consumption itself. For to consume is to eat and to eat is to live. But to be consumed is to be eaten and to be eaten is to die. Hailing this notion of being consumed and consuming is at the heart of many of Alice's strange conversation about who eats what, even who eats who. Falling down the hole, she gets stuck on the question of whether cats eat bats and sometimes whether bats eat cats. Alice toys with a mouse like a cat with a bird when she brags that Dinah is a capital one for catching mice and that she also knows a bright-eyed terrier who kills all the rats. When Alice is tiny Alice, she fears that the enormous puppy might be hungry enough to eat her. And most perplexing of all, Alice is accused of being a cannibalistic serpent by the pigeon because she eats eggs. As Nancy Armstrong has noted, all the problems with Alice's bodies begin and end with her mouth. 
Nevertheless, there seems to be hardly anything actually consumed at all. It's just there forgetting for forgetting. Kissing, in Adam Phillips' fairy tellish words, involves some of the pleasures of eating in the absence of nourishment. Carol enjoyed kissing his girl child friends as long as they were not so old as to wear their hat on top of their head or so far headed into grown updom that he would be required to tip his hat when greeting them hello. Basically, they had to be under 12. He also liked to close his letters to his posse of girl children by sending them 10 million kisses or four and three quarter kisses or two millionth parts of a kiss. In other words, he licked his letters closed with the same anorectic hedonism that feeds his Alice stories. Carol liked to call his beloved child friend Alexandria or Exy Kitchen my dear multiplication sign. In other words, not just a diminutive Exy, but all the way down to X. Along with Alice and a whole chocolate box of other pretty young girls, Exy was one of Carol's favorite subjects. And of course, an X is a kiss. X's first became associated with kisses in the Middle Ages when because most individuals were illiterate and could not write their names, documents would be scrawled with an X that would be followed by a kiss on a sheaf of animal skin so thin that it could be served as paper. A little smack next to the X affirmed sincerity. Furthermore, X is a kiss because it looks like two stylized people kissing. And most of all, X is a multiplier, like Xy herself, like the infinite reproducibility of the photograph. Both the X and the photograph are multipliers of delight and love, especially when turned on the body of Alexandra Xy Kitchen asleep. Carol could imagine nothing lovelier than Xy before his limbs amidst such delicious deliciousness. Did you know that in the late 1970s, the photo historian Colin Ford found his way into the attic of Alice Little's granddaughter? And there, within a chest of drawers, was found an old wooden chocolate box, Alan's Marvelous Chocolates. On the outside, the injunction, protect the contents from heat and damp. On the inside, within a nest of synthetic straw, were glass plate negatives of Alice and her sisters looking as delicious as ever in the costumes that Carol kept for such occasions. When we kiss, we devour the object by caressing it. We eat it in a sense, but sustain its presence. The kiss then is like a photograph. Capturing what is fleeting, the camera's fa famed devouring eye is as much mouth as eye. By extension, the camera loves people and places, not just as the conventional camera eye, but also as a consuming mouth. Photographs of shutter kisses might be understood as an extension of kissing with the eye, as if it were a mouth, as butterfly kisses. Both the kiss and the photograph are stories of taking and preserving the object, especially if the kiss on the mouth, which distinctly blurs the distinction, especially if the kiss is on the mouth, which distinctly blurs the distinction between giving and taking. In other words, just as kissing can be described as aim-inhibited eating, photographs can be described as aim-inhibited picture production. It takes and it gives. In this photograph here um, called Open Your Mouth and Shut Your Eyes, Alice parts her lips for the two cherries in her sister's hand. Alice is caught consumed by the camera, closing her eyes and opening her mouth as if ready to kiss. It is worth noting that in the 1850s, the earliest years of photography were labeled as the culinary period of photography. During this culinary period, photographers actually fixed their pictures, their stolen images as kisses in sugar, caramel, treacle, malt, raspberry syrup, ginger wine, sherry, beer, and skimmed milk. When we see the little girls in their white cupcake skirts, and their mouths open for kissing and cherries, we cannot help but read them as delicious confections, more than good enough to eat. When Carol endorsed the manufacturing of an Alice biscuit tin decorated with Tennille's illustrations, he claimed unease with the idea that he could be understood as endorsing a brand of biscuits. But perhaps he was more worried about the notion of Alice as something to eat, or even that Alice might eat him. 
just as we think that this little girl taken by uh, Carol looks like she's ready to eat her own doll, or this lovely little Red Riding Hood who is just as much wolf to eat us as little girl. <coughs> Leaving the Alice stories aside, allow me to close, well, this all seems different this night with a lesser known, nothing's lesser known to this audience, story by Carol, far too dark and strange to ever be of interest to children. But it is a story that Lacan, if he ever knew it, would have loved, a sort of witty purloined letter. The sad t tale involves one Leopold Edgar Stubbs, a castrated fellow, if there ever was one, who quite by chance happens upon Simon Lupkin's shop. Stubbs sees the sign board, Simon Lupkin, dealer in romancement. Stubbs thinks he can buy and readily consume something that will connect the threads of human destiny. But sadly, Stubbs has, as if lacking the most elementary introduction to the field of semiotics, misread the sign. And I quote uh, Carol directly. And this, is, of course, is his story, uh, Novelty and Romance Note. Standing before the base mechanics door with a throbbing and expectant heart, my eye chanced to fall once more upon that signboard. Remember, he thought it said Simon Lupkin, dealer in romancement. Once more I perused its strange inscription, oh fatal chain, oh horror, what do I see? Have I been deluded by a heated imagination? A hideous gap yawns between the N and the C, making it not one word, but two. <laughs> romancement has turned into Roman cement. He just didn't see the hole between the letters. Force-feeding every space with yet another twist of the letter, whether in a book, a poem, a pun, or the post, Carol can play at forgetting the hideous rabbit hole gap between the words Roman and cement, while hailing it at every turn. His letters are as light, empty as they are heavy. Romancement and Roman cement at once. In Carol's eight or nine words about letter writing, he insists on logging in every letter received and every letter sent out, a space for seemingly every letter. Nevertheless, letters come and go, even after death, letters are lost, some letters sit forever undelivered at the dead letter office. Many are sent to the wrong address. Some letters are just meant for forgetting. Nevertheless, there are plenty of envelopes to lick closed without fear of the nourishment, the meaning that the letter holds. The envelope is a spatiality, a rabbit hole, a cat hole, a mouth. The stamps are for dessert. And I just want to close with one more Carol letter. This one starts. My dear Amy, you asked me after those cats if you'll recall from earlier letters, who use a portfolio for a bed, blotting paper for sheets, and pen wipers for pillows. I gave them each a spoonful of ink as a treat, but they were ungrateful for that and made dreadful faces. But of course, as it was given to them as a treat, they had to drink it. One of them has turned black since. It was a white cat to begin with. Give my love to any children you happen to meet. Also, I send two kisses and a half for you to divide with Agnes, Emily, and Godfrey. Mind you, divide them fairly. Yours affectionately, C.L. Dodson. Thank you.
Other questions? Well, thank you very much.